Mass Tort News presents LegalCast. Welcome to the front line of breaking news in mass torts and other complex litigation areas. We bring you real-time intel and opinions about litigation dockets that are changing history. Camp Lejeune toxic expert Mike Partain discusses his experience as a breast cancer survivor exposed to toxic chemicals as a baby on Lejeune and his service as a Lejeune advocate. Hi, I'm Lori Freshwater and I'm here today with Mike Partain. Uh, Mike is first a friend. Um, we've been through a lot together over the past 10 years. I think it, it has to have been almost 10. 10 years. And we also served together on the community assistance panel known as the CAF. So I've asked him to come here today and mainly kind of focus on that because I think a lot of people don't really understand the resources that are available to them uh, that we have worked on kind of diligently and patiently over the years. So um, I just want to do this as kind of a, a way to expand people's understanding of what the CAP is and who better to do that than Mike. My name is Mike Partain and for those that who do not know, um, I'm one of the Camp Lejeune babies. I um, actually turned 55 later this month, but um, I was conceived, carried and born aboard the base uh, between 1967 and 1968. And, you know, for most of my life, Camp Lejeune really didn't mean much to me because when um, I was about four months old. My father was deployed to Vietnam and uh, we left the base. He took us, uh, my mother and I, um, over to uh, California where my grandfather had retired out of Camp Pendleton and left us there. And then when he got back from Vietnam, he did a tour at the Pentagon. And then when he was due to rotate back to Lejeune, thankfully, my mother said no, she didn't want to go. And uh, he took a job, a civilian job, and resigned his commission. And we moved to, to Florida. And Florida is where I grew up. And uh, roughly about 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with male breast cancer out of the blue. And that began my Camp, Camp Lejeune Odyssey. It's been, uh, this will be the 16th year now. Amazing. And when you say it's been 16 years, I really want people to know that you mean you've worked at this for 16 years. You've suffered your own health issues, but you've also really kind of got right to work on um, finding out what happened to your family and other people's families. And you really have just done so much. So from me to you, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, when you say got to work, I mean, I was diagnosed on my then wedding anniversary of April 25th, 2007. And I um, underwent surgery to remove my breast. I went through chemotherapy. And by the end of the year, I uh, joined the community assistance panel for ATSAR and began uh, my work there as a community advocate like Jerry and then yourself later on, Um, you know, just to kind of give people an idea, you know, my degree or my background, I I used to be a school teacher. Um, I taught history uh, in an international baccalaureate program, which is a a gifted kids program. Uh, The school I taught is located in Polk County, Florida. And at the time, it was the number two high school rated in the country. And, you know, so my degree is in history. And uh, at the time I was diagnosed, I was a claims uh, adjuster with State Farm Insurance. And, you know, I had a 22 career, 22 year career doing that, which is a lot of investigation analysis and everything kind of, you know, was prepped for the job per se for the, for what we did here over the past uh, 15 years, now 16 years for the Lejeune fight and stuff. So it's it's been a long time. Um, you know, people, there's a lot of people that are just coming into the issue because of all the attorneys advertising on uh, since the PACT Act was passed back in June, the first time. And, um, but, and there's a lot of people that just don't understand what we've done, how far we've how, how far we've come and just the dog fight that we've been in with the government for the past, you know, 25 years for Jerry, 15 for me, 10 for you. I mean, it's, this is something that's a saga that has just gone on and on and on, um, you know, for almost forever, it seems like. Yeah, we came in late. Even Jerry was late because of the cover up and because of them not doing what was right by their own people. Yeah, they had um, a 25 year head start on us. Right. 
Um, yeah, it, it reminds me to, you know, I try and tell people who are new to Camp Lejeune, especially attorneys who um, have handled mass tort cases before, that this is really different probably, I think I can say, than any other case because of the community. Um, the community, it's, you know, uh, it's not comparing disasters, tragedies. When I say, you know, with a place like Flint, um, people found out about Flint and there was almost immediate legal action. So the community, the law, everything was kind of moving together. Whereas in this instance, you have people in the community who have been in this fight for decades now, who've been trying to get VA benefits or who have been trying to find out more about what happened to their families. So this has been uh, this is a community that has, I think, is a lot different um, going into these these lawsuits that are coming um, and the, the different cases. I think that it's a lot different than people realize. Well, you mentioned like the community and being different. Um, it kind of harken back to uh, Simplify, the documentary, uh, Simplify Always Faithful. There's a segment in there and I mentioned, and this is why we're different from Flint. We're different from Love Canal and all these other contamination sites. You know, Camp Lejeune is a closed military installation. It's a self-contained town. Everything you need and want is aboard the base. But if you're not a Marine or a dependent of Marine, well, you can't just go waltz on the base and look at the base. And, uh, you know, you got to have a pass card or you got to be a retiree from the Department of Defense to get it, to be able to get on the base. Even if you can get on the base, you can't drive down the street and say, oh, well, that's where Laurie and Mary Freshwater lived. Well, that's where the Partains lived or that's where the Ensminger lived. And, you know, they had cancer. Uh, you can't do that because they're not there anymore. You know, it's a transitory community, meaning that, you know, like in my case, my parents arrived in April 67 and by May of 68, they were gone. So a year and a couple, a year and a month or so, uh, they were aboard the base. And you got fam some families that lived there five, 10 years during the career of their sponsor. Uh, but for most part, you know, two, three years is the most that these people were aboard the base. And then they went back to their small town, America. And, you know, that we are, our community is not centrally located where you can put everybody together like you can in Flint, Michigan. We're scattered in every town, every county, every state, and some places, even different countries across the world. And our community is fragmented because of that. And that's one of the been, that has been one of the hardest issues in our fight is trying to pull our community together so we can collectively bear weight on the government to rectify the situation that they created. Right. And in some cases, it isn't just that you can't go on base to see where people lived. You can't see the original structures because the base has basically been transformed since yeah, I was there. I mean, yeah, there, some of the structures are still there, like the Had Not Point Water Treatment Plant. That's still there. But Tower Terrace, where I believe, you, didn't your mom live in TT? No, I went to school in TT. Okay. Tower Terrace has been leveled and refigured. I mean, all the structures have been taken down and new structures put up. Um, you know, the, including the my school. I, yeah, including <laughs> your school. Um, the place where I was born is, is no longer there. The address is there, but it's a new building now. So, and that's hard for, you know, people to, um, you know, uh, understand too, until you actually see it. And also the, the, just the breadth and scope of the base is 236 square miles. Um, so these contamination sites are not just, you know, centrally located within like a hundred yards of everything. It's, you know, you've got contamination in certain locations that get into a well that goes to a treatment plant. And I know like one of the biggest questions I get from people is like, what contaminated well was I next to? And it really has no bearing on what you were exposed to because like uh, you have a water treatment plant pulls in wa water from 10 wells at a time and there's 30 wells on the tt system and 100 wells on the uh, had not point system at one point I, th I think it was 100 and they're mixing water from different locations and what's critical is what water treatment plant did you get water from so if you're in tt it doesn't matter that you live um you know 30 yards from well tt26 the most contaminated well in terra terrace what matter was you're getting Terra Terrace water from the Terra Terrace water treatment plant. Right. Uh, which my school did. <clears throat> um, I was in Paradise Point and bus to school, which is another example of, again, why thankfully the law does not exclude people. If you were on base, you were on base because everyone moved around on the base. You were, you were going to different parts. You were, you know, there's just no way 
to say if you were on that base for 30 days that you somehow managed to avoid the contaminated water. There's just no way to do it. Well, I'm sure they're going to fight it, but that's, you know, what, you know, we fought in this, we have fought this battle before with the VA and that very point, like you bring it up, you lived in Paradise Point, which was on Holcomb Boulevard water at that time. And you were bused to ter Terra Terrace, which had contaminated water. And the sad thing is after 1982, they knew it. They knew you were being bused into an area with contaminated water. And that's the sad part of the story is, you know, you've got, um, when you look at the breadth and scope of the contamination, I think you're talking, what, 34, 35 years or I, I, my degrees in history, my, it's not math. But when you look at the breadth of contamination, a lot of times what I like to explain to people is you've got different levels of um, negligence here. At the beginning, you have negligence, which is basically the, the Marine Corps had a duty to provide safe water. Uh, to its, you know, its residents. If you look at the potable water instructions, they state that the Department of the Navy is responsible for the end product. And they allowed contaminated water to get into their system and to reach the consumer. That's negligence. And at one point, um, they start to discover, you know, um, they, they have not discovered, but they start to enforce stronger regulations. They, they, and they look at... Um, a requirement to look for TCE specifically, or chlorine, I'm sorry, not TCE specifically, but chlorinated hydrocarbons specifically in the water. And then in 1974, you've got um, the base order that's written by the commanding general of the base stating that you got to dispose of hazardous materials at a certain location. Otherwise, it could le lead to drinking water contamination. So from, you know, like 1972 to 1980, you have gross negligence. They had operational knowledge that their behaviors, their practices, their, um, you know, what they did aboard the base could and would contaminate the water, but they chose to behave in a different way that ended up exposing people. And then after 1980, from 1980 to 1987, in my opinion, you have criminal negligence. They were specifically warned in writing that the water was contaminated, that they needed the test for certain chemicals. They did not. And when they did, uh, it didn't matter because they kept providing that contaminated water to the families and service personnel aboard the base and knowingly poisoned their own people. There's no excuse after 1980. So, and, and you know, when you get into the courtroom, you look at those three different levels of negligence, each one is bad. Um, but you know, the, it's, you know, what's sad is a lot of the exposures at Camp Lejeune, at least the ones after 1963, could have and should have been prevented. Right. And just to clarify, as far as living in Paradise Point, I believe I was there when they switched over to the contaminated water. So, that you know, I was like our house was on the, the contaminated line and with the golf course, which awful, you know, to have these great memories ruined. But uh, my friends and I used to go on the, the officer's uh, Paradise Point, for those who don't know, Paradise Point is where the officers are stationed. My stepfather was an officer um, in the Marine Corps. So I was bused to an area where enlisted people generally lived into our terrace. So in Paradise Point, where the officers lived on the at the officers club, there's a big golf course. And whenever they would need water for that, they would, you know, hey, we'll get it from this other place. And my friends and I used to go steal golf carts. You know, I was 12, 13 years old and we'd go ride around the golf course in the sprinklers. Um, and, you know, that's kind of horrifying now when I think about it, that we were we were doing that when um, it very well could have been the times when the, they needed the water pressure. So they switched over. I had that point. Yeah, there was an, a lot of people don't realize that. And what you're talking about in 1972, the Holcomb Boulevard system um was constructed and came online. So that system um, was not contaminated, but there was an interlinking valve that connected Holcomb Boulevard to um, the Hadnot Point. And what happened was there was uh, the Holcomb Boulevard system because they watered the golf, they used that the water the golf courses did not have enough treated water. So to replenish the water, they opened this valve up and transferred contaminated water to the Holcomb Boulevard system. And we see that in the documents in 1985 when Holcomb Boulevard actually has a uh, fuel leak from one of the generators and that fuel reached the reservoir. So, you know, contaminated the reservoir and they shut down the plant. So they open up this um, 
valve at Marston's Pavilion to allow uh, whole, um, had that point to provide water to that whole side of the base. Unbeknownst to the Marine Corps, they thought that they had uh, shut down all the contaminated wells, but they had missed one. And that was well 651 on Piney Green Road. And that one well, when they went to, they invited the state of North Carolina in to do split sampling. And when they got the samples back, uh, the most horrifying reading for me is the Berkeley Manor Elementary School water drinking water fountain. Um, they pull a sample from there, and that sample had 1,444 parts per billion of trichloroethylene in that water. And that was from one well mixed in with nine others, produced that one reading. And uh, th what, it, what this means and what you're talking about, and I don't mean to get off too much into tangent, but uh, what this means is, you know, after 1972, the personnel who lived on Paradise Point, Watkins Village, Berkeley Manor, Windway Park, and even Hospital Point, I believe, uh, received intermittent contaminated water. So they weren't, you know, they should have been safe, but they weren't because of the golf courses. Right. Because, and and it was because of the golf courses, because they wanted yep. it to be pretty. So well, for they, the officers. They, the, the, uh, the, the engineers that did the water model described to Jerry and I that when they were trying to plug in the values, because these golf courses, they require like 300,000 gallons of water and the water treatment plant at Holcomb Boulevard, uh, that's like, I think a third, if not half of the uh, capacity of the plant. So we talked to Bert Munt, which is one of the water treatment plant operators. And he said that when they turn on the golf course uh, sprinklers, you could watch the gauge go. <laughs> so when the gauge hit empty or get closed, they had to, they had to replenish the water. And, um, you know, you, it, it just, it's a sad fact that, you know, they're watering gar golf courses with clean water and then transferring contaminated water to replenish, which then, you know, cause they're watering the golf courses around five o'clock in the morning or so, um, like here in Florida, you don't water and especially in the summertime, you don't water agricultural in, in the afternoon cause it just, it burns the grass and everything. So the, but the sad part is when they finished watering the golf courses, all that water was gone. And then they transferred in, had that point water in time for the morning rush for people getting ready for school, getting up, taking the showers, getting ready to go to work. And they were getting contaminated water when that happened. And that's the sad part of this. I mean, like I said, the, most of the exposures at Lejeune, if the, if the Navy and the Marine Corps had followed their own potable water regulations, which they haven't bothered to really address with us, but it's called the NAVMAD P-5010. And if they had followed those regs, I would uh, I would wager that most of the exposures that occurred after 1963 would have been would have been prevented, because that's when they came into effect was 19 August 1963. Right, and I you know I, and I've said the two words criminal negligence for a long time since I really kind of you know, a year into this and my research, I was like, I was there from 1980 to 1983, a little bit bleeding into one year or the other, but those are solid years I was there. Um, and there's just no way that the people in charge didn't commit. I, I mean, I think it's generous to say criminal ne negligence. No, you know, it's, that's, the, it's that's generous, a generous right? reason. But it's I mean, I'm saying like it, it, right? But it, it, there, there. I think that, I, you know, I think it, it might even rise beyond that. But I, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I just am reporting on these cases. But, um, and there were people who looked at charging people criminally. Am I right? Yeah, that would, that came out right before I was diagnosed, and actually the hearing that how I found out. Um, Jerry had worked with a EPA special investigator, and he had. Um, recommended and is, was recommending, and I don't remember the exact um, phrasing and, and ideology of, the, of how it happened, but he had recommended that charges for obstruction of justice be um, pressed against uh, members of Lant Div. And these recommendations were overruled, I believe, by the White House at the time, uh, which would have been in the Bush administration. Um, Jerry was livid, and during the trial, uh, in that trial, but during the hearing in Congress, uh, Congressman Stupak actually uh, drilled down into some of this and kind of it didn't get a full admission from um, the uh, special agent, but uh, there's enough there in the transcripts when you read it. It's clear that uh, there was some uh, monkey business going on behind the door scenes. 
Um, I mean, there's when you look at the criminal part, um, unfortunately, a lot of these people are starting to die. Uh, the ones that um, were responsible for the initial cover up. Um, and when I say that, you know, this, the cover up begins in 1980 because that's when the documents show that the Marine Corps was warned and the Department of the Navy was warned and they did nothing. And now we don't know what happened before 1980, but we do know through independent labs that testing was done and a concern was raised and no action was taken. Um, one of the key, one of the key, I would, for lack of a better word, conspirators. And, you know, for those of you that are listening and, and you, you know, there's a certain amount of anger that these people that are responsible for, you know, covering up the contamination got away with it. Um, there is some poetic justice in this. Um, the one of the lead, uh, actually the the primary person who is responsible for the um, for the cover up is a guy out of Lamp Div named Jerry Walmar, who was an environmental engineer, and he ends up retiring uh, from uh, the from the Navy. Not he was a civilian employee, but he retires from Lamp Div as an environmental deputy to the Commander Naval Region Southeast which is a pretty high up position and uh, lived comfortably on the Suwannee River for a while. And when the court, when these cases, I'm sorry, when the law passed, um, I was talking to my lawyer and I said, we need to depose this guy. He's, I, I interviewed him and uh, back in 2009, and this guy is the key to breaking the, uh, the conspiracy part of the cover up as far as Camp Lejeune. Um, he authored a letter called the Walmart letter back in 1983, which is basically an action plan to remediate the base. In my opinion, it was an action plan to remediate the base um, and not really disclose what was going on. Uh, we don't have the actual letter, but we have enough references that talk about the letter to, to show what was going on. Well, anyways, uh, unfortunately for us, he passed away in February of this year. Uh, I'm sorry, February of last year, 2022 of a brain tumor, which is one of the uh, conditions that's linked with vinyl chloride. So even the ones that were, con you know, covering this up, you know, they, they really can't escape what they did either, at least in my opinion. And some of them had children on the base, I, I believe. That's not anything I have uh, yeah. any, you well, know, factual backup on. But I mean, it's possible to think that people, that there weren't higher up officers on the base at the time who had children who were at least aware of what was going on. Yeah. Um, and every so often we get this rumor that goes around that the, all the officers and their families were provided uh, bottled water and they knew that it was contaminated. It, that's not the truth. I mean, my father was no. an officer. Uh, he, he got out of the Marine Corps as a captain, but we lived in Terra Terra's because he was a junior officer and we were just exposed as everyone else. And, you know, the, yes, there's probably some upper uh, elements of the command staff that knew and, maybe taken different, you know, precautions or what have you. But, uh, you know, we were all equally poisoned civilians, base employees, dependents, and, um, service personnel. I mean, there's no rhyme or reason in that, but, uh, we're, we're kind of getting off on the thing. I want to get back to the cap cause that's what we're talking about, but there's, I mean, we can talk until we're blue in the face about this. I mean, 15 years of, uh, of fighting. I mean, there are so many points since I've been involved, that we got to a point to where this issue would collapse and go away. And uh, I know the Navy wanted it to, but we, we hung on and, and, and persevered. And I mean, I'm sure, you know, Jerry went through all the stuff that he had to go through. I mean, he went through seven years without even getting any feedback that he was getting anywhere. And most people, I mean, I see people on social media that they're, you know, giving, wanting to give up and throw in the towel and they've only been involved in like this whole issue four or five months. I mean, it's, this is a, a long haul march and you just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other. I mean, I can't, uh, there are so many people that played roles in this fight and helped and did what they could that are no longer here. People like Peter Devereux, who's a male breast cancer survivor. He died in 2014. You got, um, uh, Colonel David, um, I can't remember his last name now, but, uh, um, Bedworth, Colonel Bedworth. And he was uh, a junior officer in the mess halls and he ended up with a brain tumor. And I, I went to say goodbye to him as he laid in his deathbed in a coma because the brain tumor had shut his brain down and, and what, you know, 
he died. He's buried over in Arlington. He died in 2010, I believe now. And then, you know, you got Danita McCall, who actually died during the filming of Semper Fi. Uh, she had parathyroid cancer that spread to her lungs and her diaphragm and her heart. Um, you got your mother, Mary, who was also in Semper Fi and had I mean, probably the most powerful presentation showing your brother his jumper and, you know, asking the question that every mother that had a child at Camp Lejeune, did, did, did something I do harm my child? She died of leukemia. And was it uh, 2013? 13, uh, yeah. Just almost, Her, uh, the 10 year anniversary is coming up yeah. um, in a, what, you know, a week or so. Yeah, I remember so. uh, I was walking in the, uh, I was taking a trail walk and I got the call about your mom. And there's so many people like that that have gone through this and, and hope to see an end before they, they passed that are not here anymore. And, um, you know, we owe it to them and to all of us to keep fighting and not give up. I mean, this, you know, there, we saw the Supreme Court uh, decision in 2014, and a lot of people gave up on that. And, you know, the thing is, uh, we're still here, we're still fighting, we're still moving forward. And we're going to hold the government accountable. And the, the sad thing is, you know, one of the reasons I got involved in this is because these people play God with our lives. And um, I mean, they knew I'd been exposed and I had a 2.5 centimeter tumor in my right breast. The, according to Moffitt Cancer Center here in Tampa, they said that my tumor was probably in my body 11 years before I found it. And it would have been nice to know that I was exposed um, because when I, you know, I didn't have a lot of symptoms, but we may have found a tumor way before they had to take off my right breast. I mean, you can do lumpectomies now or maybe I could have avoided chemotherapy, which wrecked my health. Um, you know, that, that's a lot of things. And then, you know, how many people in our community sat down and talked to a doctor and got that if I had only caught this three months ago and then they get the death sentence that, oh, I'm sorry, it, there's nothing we can do. And that that's the frustrating part. And then the other part is you look at Red Hills Pearl Harbor and what's happened there over the past decade with the fuel tanks, which were built at the same time as Camp Lejeune's fuel tanks were, leaked into the potable water supply for not only the base, but the entire island, island of Oahu. And, um, you know, they're dealing with that now. And when you, last uh, 2021, when, it, uh, when they caught this contamination, the Navy did the same exact things. They beat, you know, they downplayed it. We got it just in time. People were really exposed. Some of the same quotes that we heard in the newspapers in 1985, like from the base, uh, the Camp Lejeune's base environmental engineer, Robert Alexander, brother Bob, as he's known on the base, um, said, oh, people weren't directly exposed to the pollutants. I mean, how can, how more exposed can you be by drinking it? The quotes are almost the same word for word. It's as if they had a playbook at Camp Lejeune and they said, well, this poisoned about a million people or, you know, whatever, but let's keep this in case it happens again. And then we'll just use the same thing. It was, un I mean, I, I still can't process really that that happened again. The, the behavior is not going to change until they're held accountable. And that's part of our story here and why it's so important that people stand up and, um, and do something about this because if they don't, then the, the Navy's and the Department of Defense, because it's not just a Navy problem, but the Department of Defense is going to learn from the mistakes and they'll just do it better. So next time they don't get caught. And that's the sad story about the uh, about this is that even though we have fought so hard for so long, when it happened, it ha um, the behavior didn't change. And, you know, we need to we need to see this f um, through the finish line and see this uh, concluded with, um, you know, with, with this law. And, you know, the only way we're going to hold the government accountable is through the pocketbook and through the court system. Right. And, 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 you know, and we're going to, going to go into the cap, but I just want to mention as, you know, to kind of close this first section, um, it's not just um, the people who were poisoned directly. It's, it's generational trauma we're talking about, you know, um, my, as I posted um, on New Year's recently on Facebook that, you know, my little brother died on New Year's. And so that was when I was seven years old. So my whole childhood, 
um, you know, every New Year's was just fraught with grief. And because you, as a child, you are, you're, you know, your mom's just devastated. Um, so much was taken. There's so much trauma. And, and that goes on to my daughter who has to deal with the things that I'm carrying, not just the physical, but the mental. Um, and that's with the Lejeune, it's, it's decades and it's generations and generations of trauma. So um, I, I agree with you. And that's why I really want to encourage people, as you said, to please don't get impatient uh, with this process. The Navy will try to do what they can to delay but you can't give up. You just got to stay there and, and be a bulldog and, um, you know, a devil dog. And, uh, and, and, and I hope people do because we, this is the only way we'll change their behavior. So you're not just fighting for the past and what has been done to you and your, your loved ones or your family or your community. You're fighting for the future. You're fighting for the future of not just our service members and their families, but the people in surrounding communities who are now being affected by PFAS, um, which is a whole nother story that's coming. So, um, so yeah, answer. yeah, it is very ugly. I mean, I, I'll tell you this, Laurie, I, there, I would gladly give up any amount of money that is owed to me by the government for what they did just to be what I thought I was before I was diagnosed with cancer. And I say thought Absolutely. I was because... I was made with this stuff and it has affected my life from the moment I came out of actually the, from the moment I was conceived, I was made with, you know, made with the stuff and it affected me. I mean, coming out of the womb, I didn't escape it and it has played a part in every part of my life. I just didn't know it until April of, of 2007. And even then I was diagnosed with cancer, but it wasn't until June, 2007, about two and a half months after I was diagnosed that I connected the dots and found out that the, where I was born and that I had been exposed to coordinated um, solvents, which are responsible for cancer, but I would gladly give everything up just to be healthy. Um, I'm, I turned 55 at the end of the month. I, I reach AARP eligibility now, but um, you know, um, I would just like, you know, my mom's 80. And um, will I make it that far? I mean, there's no guarantees in life. I might get hit by a truck tomorrow, but, you know, is my quality of life going to be sufficient that I could, you know, enjoy my life when I'm that age? Or am I going to be an invalid? Uh, you know, those are things I have to worry about. Is the cancer going to come back? I, every year I go to Moffitt and, they, you know, cancer survivors have a thing called scanxiety where, you know, when you go to your annual checkup and they poke and prod you and uh, like in my case, they do mammograms and blood work and everything. And you do all that up uh, leading to the appointment that week. And um, I mean, there's no way to describe it. I, I make fun of it and say, you know, you get so anxious and uptight, you couldn't sledgehammer a pen up your ass um, because, you know, you, you sit there and the doctor walks in and you, Everyone knows what that feeling is when you walk, the doctor walks in and he looks at you and says, I'm sorry, you have cancer. I mean, that's scary. And you just, when you go back for the scans, you, every time the doctor walks in, you cringe and you, are you going to hear those words again? And I just had my follow-up in December and yeah, 15 years later, it's still, still there. And, um, you know, he doctor walked in and, you know, I looked at his face. So I knew when he walked in, what he's going to tell me, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a different way of life than what should be normal. And the pain and suffering, you always hear people talk about, oh, I just want justice. I don't care about the money. Um, but, uh, you know, and it's true, you know, there's no number, fig there's no dollar figure that can ever match the pain and suffering. It's, it's, it's not possible. So, um, so, and, 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 if you haven't had cancer, if you're lucky like me, every every health scare, I was in the hospital for a week in October and everything becomes a giant cancer scare. You know, like you just, that anxiety you're talking about, um, perfectly put with the sledgehammer thing, but I won't repeat it. Um, that That is something that we live with. Yeah, cancer is the, uh, is the thing that goes bump in the night. Uh, I can honestly say that. I mean, I've, I've, I've say when I go out and do... Um, 
been doing some town halls over the past six months. And, uh, you know, I relate uh, the story of being diagnosed with cancer. When I was in college, I had a gun put to my head and the uh, manager where I was working at, they beat her because she couldn't get the register open. And I sat there the whole time wondering, okay, well, do you hear the shot or you die first? And luckily she got up off the ground and was able to get the register open and they got the money and took off. I was scared. But let me tell you something. I was never more scared than when my doctor walked in and looked at me and says, Mike, I'm sorry, you have cancer. I mean, I, I just, I hadn't talked about it in a while. And I, I, the first time I, even when I relate that, it just, it messes me up because, I mean, I, that was the most terrifying moment of my life. And not knowing how, how bad it was, how far it spread, and having children between seven and 17 years old, wondering how they're going to eat, where they're going to stay, you know, are, is my family going to be okay? Am I going to make it? And, you know, all those flash through your mind and you hear those words because, you know, like the doctor told me, he said, I can't tell you where the cancer has gone. I can't tell you how bad it is until I get in there and take it out. And the one thing he told me was Dr. Schneider in Tallahassee. He says, Mike, I promise you when you wake up, I will be right next to you and I will tell you whether I got it all or not. And he did. And when I woke up, he says, I think I got it, Mike. And I've been very blessed. Um, two and a half centimeters is a huge tumor for it to not spread throughout my body. 